we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about um, the flesh. It's kind of a really misunderstood um, concept within Christianity. Um, so I have some questions to kind of like start some conversation off. If you guys like, just want to jump in and answer. Um, the first question is, I mean, kind of a broad question, but how would you define the, what the flesh is? Like, what is the flesh, scripturally speaking? Primarily, like views and mind. Primarily, bodies and mind, and like desires and stuff like that. Can you guys hear him? Yeah, I can. Yeah, well, it's just what we were born with, basically. Anybody else have any thoughts what the what the flesh is? Like, um, I would say it's anything that your mind physically appeals to, you know. So what you see, what you want what you believe that is needed through society. Yeah. This is just free to so like, um, yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, when I, when I think of the flesh, I think of a just very sensual, very self-seeking, self-motivated uh, mentality. That's what I think about. Okay. Yeah, so when you guys, when we look at, um, one thing that I like to do in, in my, like, uh, the Bible on my phone is, like, search for a particular word and then just, like, look at all the times it appears in the Bible in the different contexts, and you can sometimes learn some pretty interesting things. And um, anyway, we did that the other day with, actually, with this word, with flesh, and kind of like you guys said, Sometimes it appears in a neutral form. It's just simply talking about having a body or it's, it's it, like it says that Jesus, you know, was the word made flesh. That's not a flesh in that context. Isn't a bad thing. It just means that he had a body, a uh, physical body, but in other places, flesh definitely does have the type of connotation that you mentioned, Brian. It very much depends on the context. Um, and in those cases, it's referring to, the sinful nature and the lusts of the flesh um, that manifest in our bodies, so to speak. Um, so it's important that we know which connotation of flesh applies if we're looking at a particular scripture. Tyler basically is going to teach my entire Bible study here. It's <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> All right, the next question, unless anybody has any other thoughts. Any other thoughts? No? Okay. The next question is, what does it mean to live in the flesh? Ooh. <laughs> I would say, like, just apart from God, just, like, your own whatever you want. Like, not even trying to, like, think about God at all. Or we, like, function by our feelings, like, the physical aspect. Like, we're hungry, we eat. Um, we lust after something, we decide to pursue it, we have sex, we fulfill that need, that desire, we're tired, we go to sleep. Anybody else? Depends on if you're living in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what does it mean to live in the flesh, though? <laughs> what does it mean to live in the flesh? Oh, man. I, I really, just to sum it up, I think it's a very self-seeking, self-motivated uh, mentality where all of your desires, if they don't line up with you, flesh doesn't like that very much. That's just what I think. So I'm not going to go on a giant ramble here, but the same, this, the same thing I said a second ago to the first question applies here. Like for example, Galatians 2.20, says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Paul's just saying the life I now live in my body, right? But on the other hand, he says in Romans 8, right, that, uh, that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then he says, you, however, are not in the flesh. So there's, again, context. What are we talking about here? Um, so talking about verses already uh, 
<laughs> already picked out Skyler. <laughs> okay, cool. Anyway, carry, carry on. <laughs> I do. <laughs> that I feel like most people disagree on in, in the church. Um, this is kind of where like the schism per se happens amongst most Christians. It is the question of, can we be free from the flesh? <laughs> so historically, um, you know, there's, you know, the more conservative churches, um, I mean, I've been taught all my life, that you know you're born with a sinful nature, right? And that you're going to struggle with that sinful nature, and you're going to have it for the rest of your life. Um, you know, and that you have to, you know, earn sanctification by a process, which we talked about last week with sanctification. Um, so most there's a lot of divide on this question. Like, can we? Is it possible? Can we be free from the flesh? What do you guys think? Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes. <laughs> Definite yes. That's the whole reason Jesus came. It's the whole reason he died and rose again so that we might die to our former self and live a different life that he died for us to have. Uh, it's, it's really simple. It's the whole gospel. It's the whole reason why he died, to redeem us, to restore us before the fall. God breathed life into Adam. When he rose again, he went to his disciples. What did he do? He breathed life into them again. Uh, what Skyler said, those who are living in the flesh cannot please God. We don't live according to the flesh, but the spirit. And uh, anyways. Thank you, Ryan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Kayla, you're allowed to talk too. Mr. Hey? There's a woman over there. No, no, I'm listening. The, the wisdom will come later. By our physical bodies, I mean, like, well, I haven't defined it yet. I'm not yeah. it's open for whoever. Then, like, we should also be stuck with our physical bodies, but, like, our nature is not. So, a few weeks ago, I did a, um, I did a study on salvation and what salvation is. You guys were, some of you guys weren't here. Uh, I think they were. Um, so how does our understanding of salvation impact how we understand the flesh? And I can ask that again, if it was wordy, how does our understanding of what salvation really is impact how we understand the flesh? I see you nodding over there, Skyler. <laughs> Sorry, I was just busy eating some fruit from the Tree of Life. No big deal. Um, <laughs> um, well, so with when I saw your salvation um, Bible study, which was awesome, but like we have to understand the point of salvation. Like, what what have I been saved from? What have I been saved to? Why did I need to be saved in the first place? What does it mean? Like all that stuff, and so freedom is wrapped up in that and um the negative connotation of flesh meaning this seat this uh if you will foundation point of lust the lusts of the flesh sinful desires sinful nature all that stuff that's what salvation sets you free from <laughs> among other things so uh yes to whatever your question was in the beginning <laughs> yeah, I mean, because if we have an incorrect understanding of what salvation is, we can't have a correct understanding of the flesh. Um, because if we just believe that salvation is, oh, okay, God forgives you and you go to heaven when you die, that does not answer the question of the flesh. I mean, because forgiveness doesn't transform, it just forgives you, it doesn't transform you. So when we talked about salvation a couple weeks ago, we talked about like, what is salvation? Salvation is transformation right? 
um, Second Corinthians five seventeen. You know, like the old has gone, the new has come. I am a new creation in Christ. Um, it's not just the fact that you're forgiven; is that you are transformed. So salvation and transformation go hand in hand. So if we have a faulty view of what salvation is, we cannot understand like what the flesh is and like what our role with the flesh is at that point. Um, does anybody else have another comment before I move on to our last question? You said it all. Okay. <laughs> uh, the last question before we open up the word is how does our understanding of the flesh affect how we perceive temptation? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's in the... Oh, was someone about to say something? Yeah, Stephen. Uh, like if we believe we can't be free from the flesh, we'll think that our temptation is actually from us. Whereas if we believe that we can be free from the flesh, then we'll know that those temptations are external from mm. Satan. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you guys hear him? Well can, you, can you repeat it? <laughs> so if we believe that we can be free from the flesh, then we, and when we're saved, then we know that temptations are external. But if we believe we can't be free from the flesh, then when we're tempted, we'll think, oh, it's because of I'm still sinful. I'm still, it's, it's coming from me. I'm not, there's something I'm still struggling with. It's still, I'm still not, um, I guess, fully saved or fully sanctified. Thank you. Right. Brian, what were you going to say? Um, just to make sure, can you repeat the question one more time? Just so I... How does our understanding of the flesh affect how we perceive temptation? Uh, yeah. Well, I think, uh, un I mean, understanding the flesh, understanding what it is, it motivations are always self-seeking. And, uh, you know, James, he, in his letter, I believe it was James, he said, you're bored and enticed by your own desire, uh, right? And so, to, to me, my, my simple answer is is what if what if our desires are changed right what if we, what if we realize that that's not who we are that the flesh is separate from the other life that we've been given that gives us new desires and uh anyways yeah yeah i mean i feel like Stephen really hit the nail on the head when he said like you know whether or not we believe coming back to the third question i asked is like can we be free from the flesh if we believe no we cannot then our whole life is going to be just struggling and striving to manage our behavior. But if we believe, yes, we can be free from the flesh and that we are made a new creation, then we are gonna be able to look at temptation differently and be like, okay, I'm really tempted to do this, but is that coming from something in me, from my sinful nature, or is that coming from the devil as an attack, right? So it's two com completely different um, mindsets of how you look at it, and that affects like the rest of your life. Um, so, got those questions out of the way, we're gonna get started. I mean, and Skylar kind of already set the foundation for um, <laughs> the, the skeleton of what I'm going to say, be saying here. Um, but Skylar actually t taught me a couple days ago that the Greek word for flesh is actually the word sarx, S-A-R-X. That's the word that they use in the Greek in the New Testament whenever the word flesh is used. The problem with that is that um, we translate it into just the word flesh but it has multiple different meanings, but it has the same word. Um, so like Skylar said, flesh can be used to talk about the, like our physical body is like physical flesh. Um, it's also used to describe um, like your sinful nature, like what you were born into um, before you were born again. But I've also found a third category that it falls into the flesh. Um, it, and there are several instances in the Bible where they talk about the flesh when they talk about works or willpower. Um, kind of like salvation by by keeping the law in a sense um and we'll we'll look at that um so first we're just kind of establish i mean we don't need to go in depth in it but just to prove that you know these, these do have different meanings um so i want to open up romans 8 8 anybody have it yeah go ahead and read it <laughs> who 
whoever wants to read it, go ahead and read it. <laughs> Romans 8 8. <laughs> I think that's good. There's like seven. I'm just going to Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, so which definition of flesh do we think this is talking about? The really bad one. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. Adorbs. So the simple nature. Yeah. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Okay, cool. Obviously, I'm pointing out here that in this case, they're not talking about the body because obviously those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Like that would mean nobody can please God if we're talking about the body in this case. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm just showing differences yes. here. The next one is John 1, 14. John 1, 14. And this is the one that Skylar already mentioned. <laughs> and the word was my flesh. I couldn't hear you, Josiah. Say it again. <clears throat> and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, great. And so, we beheld his glory. Yeah. So, what definition of flesh is this one talking about? The good one? It's not good, it's just neutral. Your your body, right? Your yeah. physical body. Um, you know, obviously they're not saying that Jesus became sinful nature. You know, they're saying that he took on human form, right? So sometimes it gets confusing, like when we're reading the New Testament, it talks about the flesh and we don't have an understanding of like which flesh they're talking about, it can make reading it difficult to understand and like make it all kind of jumbly when it talks about like, oh, do I still have the flesh or do I not? Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, so it's good to kind of make a baseline. Um, and Skylar, how about you read this one for us since you mentioned it also, Galatians 2.20. <laughs> this is my verse, man. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what's that definition of flesh there? Neutral. It's, it's again, it's talking about the, the body. He's not saying the life I live now is in the sinful nature, right? So we have to be aware of this. Um, and there's one more I just want to look at. Again, we don't have to go super in depth in these, but just kind of proving a point. And the last one is Ephesians 5:31, and I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, this one, I really like this. One. Ephesians 5:31 says, "For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh." Now this one <clears throat> kind of goes deeper, actually, than just the physical body. Um, because they're kind of talking about like a soul connection here too, you yeah. know, so it kind of brings in that aspect of it. Um, but again, here they are specifically talking about like, you know, the physical body. They're not saying the two shall become one sinful nature, right? Like that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> well, unless they're <laughs> not in marriage. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, um, okay. So are we good on that? We can move on. Um, so now let's look at verses that talk about the flesh being actually talking about the sinful nature. Um, we're going to be in Romans for a minute here. So let's flip to Romans. Please. Romans 7, verses 5 and then 18. So skipping a bunch. Just verse 5 and 18. Seven, five, eighteen. Just read one. All right. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. All right. So, what flesh is that one talking about? Yeah. It says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh. 
obviously we're still in our physical bodies, um, I hope. Um, so they're saying were, I also like how it's past tense were, so it's meaning that there's, we aren't in the, we aren't in the flesh anymore, so we must be in something else. Um, you want to read, read 18? You want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my nature. Some versions say, they actually say simple nature, other versions say flesh, so it kind of depends what version you have. Um, so yeah. Um, we're just seeing here that there's a contrast and we have to just be careful um, of jumping to conclusions if, there, if there's verses that we see that say, you know, talk, it makes it seem like they're talking to Christians that are, and saying that you still are in the realm of the flesh. Like what flesh are they talking about? Are they using present tense, past tense? Because again, we've seen that, you know, our understanding of the flesh really can impact what our Christian journey looks like. It affects how we look at temptation and affects how we look at salvation and all of that. Um, all right, there's two more verses. Um, who wants to get um, Romans 8, 1 through 4? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Cool. They use the, like the word flesh like five times in like those verses. Um, uh, just look at it real quick. Um, do you guys think they're talking about the same definition for each one, or do you think he's talking about something different, or what? Yeah. Yeah. What? I, I can definitely, knowing what I know now, I would be able to tell where those differences would be in terms of body and sinful. Oh, okay. Um, so I imagine, uh, for God is done with the law weakened by the flesh, I imagine that's the sinful nature. Uh, could not do, but sending his own son the likeness of, of sin, the likeness of sinful flesh, I imagine that's the body. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. I'm going to go with body on that one, too. Not sure. Uh, uh, and then uh, in verse four, when he says, walk out according to the flesh, talking about sinful nature. What do you guys think? Huh? What do you guys think? I think he's right, because the version I'm looking at, the NLP, it doesn't use flesh. It uses both body and sinful nature, like right where Ryan was saying. It should be body or simple nature. I think that's really helpful, actually, because like this whole concept of flesh can be really confusing to people. So if there's a Bible that or version that like just translates it as simple nature or body, well, that's yeah, really helpful. Yeah, NLP has been doing that. Like this, all the verses we've been looking at has been either simple nature or body. That's awesome. Um, all right. I think I have Colossians two thirteen. Okay, so I'll read this one. Colossians 2.13 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So this one is interesting because they're talking about the flesh of the body as a metaphor for the flesh, meaning the sinful nature. So I brought this one up because in this context, he's literally saying the uncircumcision of your flesh, like literally like your physical body, but like that's a metaphor for your actual sinful nature because we know that circumcision, you know, that flesh had to be cut off. It was removed completely, right? And so when we're born again um, and we take on Christ's new nature, our sinful nature is similarly cut off and removed. 
just like in circumcision. It's not something that we have to manage our whole life or, you know, strive to take a, to, to control and, you know, wrestle against all our lives. He's making a parallel saying here, you know, you were dead in your sins, just like when you were uncircumcised. Like, does that make sense? Um, so they talk about circumcision a lot. And I never heard about, like, why are they making such a big deal about this? Like, I really don't get it. But it's such a beautiful, like, clear metaphor of, like, look, circumcision it means to be cut off. And so it's not there anymore. And that's how they want us to look at the simple nature um, when you become alive in Christ. Um, you guys have any questions about that or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. NLT. It says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. Bro, the NLT is killing yeah, it right good. now. It's like, good. we need versions. <laughs> NLT is great. <laughs> Love that. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. Yo, I need to find whoever wrote this version and shake their hand. <laughs> like, good job, sir. Awesome. Probably a lot of people. All right, let's see. Um, and the last one is Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And this one, I'm just going to read really quick because it's just very obvious. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, blah, 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 blah. And so here it's, you know, obviously using the definition of your sinful nature. But it's interesting, too, because if you notice, like, the first couple ones are actually sinful nature that you actually do with your body. So, you know, like sexual morality is something you do with your body, but it also is rooted in the sinful nature, if that makes sense. Um, one thing that actually Skylar um, helps me to realize is that like your body in and of itself um, is not sinful or neither is it good. It's just kind of a neutral vehicle, if you will. Um, and what drives the body is what you allow to have mastery over you. So your flesh, your physical body flesh can be driven by the spirit or it can be driven by the simple nature. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that anymore, Skylar, since you're the one who kind of, you know, opened my eyes to this, <laughs> put you on the spot here. Uh, no, you said it pretty well. Um, another sort of way of, of phrasing it would be that you know our bodies our body is an instrument our body like you said can be used for good or for evil um, and what we choose to agree with here in our inner world is going to determine how that instrument is used is is played what kind of music it produces yeah. And so a lot of the times coming back to is our sinful nature dead or is it not, the devil will speak through our flesh, our physical body, you know, and make us feel like, oh, I really want to eat that or I really want to do that with that person or whatever, speaking through a fleshly, like physical body desire. And we think it's coming from ourselves because we feel it. But, you know, the difference between having a and a temptation which is an attack versus it's coming and originating from somewhere within you that's not sanctified or it's still rooted in you. Does that make sense? So I feel like sometimes when the temptation is a physical bodily temptation, it's harder to recognize that it's not coming from you because you physically experience it, if that makes sense. But the devil can use our bodies as his mouthpiece um, just as God can use our bodies as his mouthpiece. You know, like he speaks through our bodies through healing um, and the devil can speak through our bodies through a number of ways, which I'm sure you guys know. Um, yeah. All right. So the last category, which um, we haven't talked about yet, was I noticed as I was like putting the study together that they also often use the flesh to talk, to talk about work and willpower, not just the body and not just the simple nature, but like trying to achieve your own salvation via keeping the law or driving really hard or like you know, your own behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yes. 
So we're going to be in Galatians the whole time, so we won't flip around. Who wants to read Galatians 2.21? Anybody? 221, you said? Yes, Galatians 221. <clears throat> I'll read it. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, Christ is dead in vain. What version do you have, Lisa? King James. Okay. Does anybody have ESV? Want to read that? Yeah. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Okay, cool. I don't remember what version it was. Um, it's not the version I have. When I was looking it up earlier, I. It might have been King James, or I'm not sure, but it said, um, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained by the flesh, Christ died for nothing. And so here, that, that, that word flesh doesn't fit into the body or sinful nature category, because that wouldn't make sense. If righteousness could be gained through the sinful nature, Christ died for nothing. That doesn't really make sense. If righteousness could be gained through the body, Christ died for nothing. So here, they're kind of implying the works or willpower saying like we were never able to, to be good through our own willpower if we were if we were able to do that then christ would never had to come does that make sense mm -hmm. so that's the first kind of example we see of that the next one is in chapter 3 1 through 6 galatians 3 1 through 6 i need someone who's feisty to read this one. Oh. who's going to read it with a feisty voice Brian, I feel like it's going to be you. It's going to be me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm feisty. I can do passion. I'm good at that. Oh, yeah. Mr. Passion over here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Oh, you, said, you said one through three? Uh, no, no, no. Galatians three, one through six. One through six. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Pause. Having... Pause. <laughs> I want to stop right there. Um, that one sentence. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of the word? Oh. Another translation says, did you receive the spirit by the flesh or by believing what you heard? Isn't that like awesome right there? This is so good. I'm like, having a good time. Talking to the Christians, saying like, yo, why are you guys being dumb? <laughs> That's literally what he said. He said, you foolish Galatians. Like, what? <laughs> like, did you, main, did you become sanctified by your own willpower? Or was it by having faith in what you heard about the gospel? All right, go ahead and keep reading. Okay. Um, Verse three. Verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Oof. Yeah, I really like um, in verse three, kind of at the at the end, it says, "After by after beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh?" Again, that flesh is meaning the works and the willpower. So again, the Galatians heard the good news that hey, Christ died. You know, He made you sanctified, right? But now they're slipping back into works mentality, which I feel like is what a lot of people have grown up hearing. Like, okay, cool, you're a Christian. Now you better do a really good job of cleaning up your act and like making sure you abide by X, Y, Z rule and like getting your act together, right? And so he's saying like, are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? It's like, oh, did Christ only bring us so far? Do we have to make up the rest of the way on our own? Like, and that's crazy. Like, obviously no, because like, why would he have come then if we were able to do it on our own? 
right? All right, and the last one, who wants to read Galatians 6, 12 to 15? Skylar, I volunteer you. Very well, except. <laughs> um, Galatians 6, 12 through 15, I have ESV. Uh, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so, pointing out the two times I use flesh in this passage, um, very beginning of 12, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh. Literally, we see this all the time. People who want to impress people by how good they are and how many rules they keep and how many times they pray a day or how many Jesus bumper stickers they have, you know, like as if any of that matters, like, you know what I'm saying? Um, and that's like how Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, said, don't do your works of righteousness in front of others to impress them because you've already gotten your reward, right? He's like, that does nothing for you, you know, at the soul and spirit level. And then the next part where they say flesh is, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. I lost it. Anyways, what does, what does your version say in verse 12? Just, um, 612 in NLT. Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching what the cross of Christ, what the cross of Christ alone can say. Let me read that again. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can say. Wow. And like, I don't know about you guys, but like, um, all my life as a Christian, like I have been like exhausted because like, I'm constantly like, you know, every new year I'm like, okay, this is the year I'm going to like get my act together and not do all these bad things that like, I've been trying to not do. Like literally I'd make lists of like all the sinful, like adjectives about myself that I would like purge of myself this year. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> and like, I'd make lists of like discipline things I was going to do. I even set alarms on my phone, guys. Like literally, like at 8 p.m. I'm like, pray for this. And like at 12 o'clock, I like pray to avoid sin. Like I have that on my phone. It's like, as I'm constantly afraid that like sin is like this thing I have to wrestle with all day long. And like, I have to pray to avoid it. <laughs> and I'm like, it's exhausting. Like you're constantly fighting something that like has been killed already. You know, but the devil doesn't want you to know that because then, like, if you're fighting the wrong enemy, you can never win, right? If you're fighting against yourself, you're never fighting against him. So, like, anyways, I don't know if you guys have that same experience or not, like, feeling like um, you're all Christianity is one big, like, behavior checklist, you know? Yeah, and then the other thing is, I never understood the, for my, for my yoga is easy and my burden is light. I was like, no, it's not. Yeah, I know. It's, really tough. <laughs> yes. it's really hard. Did you guys hear him? Like, that's perfect. You're, like, literally, I agree. Like, where Jesus was like, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And I was like, hmm. No, is it? <laughs> it's super hard. You have is to do all not? this right stuff. <laughs> like, you can't do anything fun. <laughs> right? So, hey, that's my mom, I think. Oh, that's your mom? At the cool. bottom. Hi, mom. She's connecting to audio. It's okay. Anyways. <clears throat> Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah, man, I, I know, uh, I didn't really hear Stephen, but Grace, I know what you're talking about. I spent two years of my life um, very, very religious, um, trying my best in my own ability to carry out what I knew was right. And all it ever left me was in a place of condemnation shame i was never enough i had no ability in and of myself to walk out what i knew 
uh, was right, you know, and all I saw, and it leaves you in this place where all you see when you look at the cross is, wow, I put him there and look at me. He did all this for me. He loves me so much. And look at me. I, I can't, I can't even do the simple thing he asked me. to do. You know, it's like a Romans seven. When you, when you try to approach it from your own works, you have no ability to do so. But then spirit came and all of a sudden it just, by faith, he just changed me. You know, it says we're saved by grace through faith. But if you're believing in the wrong God, if you're believing in the God that wants to lead you exactly where you were, right, in the death, in the place of your own sin, your own mud, if you're believing in the wrong God, grace has no avenue to empower you through truth to walk out what Christ called you to. His whole point of, of why he died. Sometimes I feel like we, we talk about how he died all the time, but he, did he not rose again? Is he not the God who lives, who gives new life, who makes us a new creation? Man, it's, it's so crazy. I spent so long in that place, and no one ever told me the true gospel, the gospel that sets you free. But anyways. So, um, you bring up your point, Ryan. Um, I'll, I'm actually going to do a study eventually. I've been getting up to it. Um, but eventually, I'm going to do a study on what grace is, because I think that's super misunderstood. Um, because, like, generally, I mean, like, we view grace more as mercy. Um, you know, like, God's just like, oh, you did that bad thing. Well, there's grace for that, right? Or, like, oh, man, I, you know, I stumbled into sin, and, like, I can't seem to get free from it. Um, you know, I just keep doing this over and over again. But, you know, there's grace for that. Grace, and my grace is sufficient for you, right? So we turn grace into an enabler rather than what it really is. And grace is an empowerer. It empowers you to do what you were never able to do before when you were in the sinful nature. Now that you are no longer in the sinful nature, you're a new creation. Grace has empowered you to do those things and to walk in holiness that you never were able to do before. But like we've perverted the, what grace is and made it like this, oh, well, you know, it's okay, you know. So there's a quote by Dan Moeller. He says, um, he's my favorite like speaker, pastor or whatever. He says, grace without transformation is perversion. Cool. And like Amen. that sent that like few word sentence right there like wrecked my life. And I was like, wait, wait, so what have I been thinking grace is this whole time? You know, grace does not enable anything. Grace empowers, and that's really powerful. And and what you're saying isn't some cheap grace. It's not a license to sin. You know, people hear that all the time. It's not a license to grace is the transformative power of God to allow you to walk out what truth calls you to. Right, and we have to believe that, though. If we don't believe that we can walk in holiness and that we can be new creations, then that's not what we're going to experience. That's why it says we are saved by grace through faith, right? And Ryan, like, this is your favorite thing ever. Like, it's my favorite thing ever. I know. So, like, I we're not just saved by grace, but we have to have faith in that. If we don't have faith in that, then we're never going to believe it, we're never going to experience it. It's the whole gospel, man. It's everything that set me free. I uh, propose that on this topic that someone read Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Why don't you go ahead and read that? Okay. I thought you'd never ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Titus, what? Write this down Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Okay, that part we usually agree on. The next part's the part we were just talking about. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Oh, That's what man. Grace does. That is what grace does. Wow. Grace does oh. you to stay the same. Okay. You read that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so 
we're moving on to the next little segment. Um, I think we all pretty much agree at this point, but just to solidify any possible doubt for people that may watch this video that aren't here, um, we're going to look at some verses that say, like, for sure, the flesh, not our bodies and not whatever, but the simple nature flesh is dead and that it's no longer with us, that it has no part in us, um, that there's not some secret sin still living in you. You know, we see that, like, the, you guys heard the analogy of, like, the white dog and the black dog that live inside of you and, like, whichever one you feed more is the one that thrives. I've heard that preached in sermons. You know, like as if you have both good and terrible living inside of you simultaneously, right? So we're gonna look at some verse that some verses that kind of just blow that out of the water. Um, okay, Romans. We're like in Romans this whole time because it's so good. Romans six ten twelve. <laughs> Anybody want to read it? Would you say it again? Romans 6, 10 through 12. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin, alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. So I think we read this one actually last week as well. We talked about sanctification. Um, I like how it parallels Jesus' death and, and makes a metaphor for our death. So it says, you know, talking about Jesus, the death he died, he died once and for all, right? Like Jesus didn't go through like this masochistic, like dying repeatedly over and over and over and over again every day, right? He died once and that was it, right? So then it says in verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, right? You guys ever heard the phrase, like, I die daily? You know, yeah. we use that term to mean, like, oh, well, you know, I've got constantly got to, like, you know, crucify my flesh and put it to death because it still rises up in me and it's still there. And I got to, like, whack a mole it to death because it keeps popping up. You know, and it's like, no, that's not what it says. It says Christ died once and for all in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. And so it says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So like, it's not there. It used to be, but it's not there anymore. Isn't that awesome? Oh, it's so good. Super right, awesome. Anybody have a thought? Or comment? No? All right, the next one is Romans 8, verse 9. Yeah, I have a thought. What's up, Mom? Everyone say hi to my mom. It was just her birthday a few days ago. Do what? Happy belated birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy belated birthday. 39 again. Oh, yeah, yep, <laughs> it, was, it was surprisingly good. But um, I think when this thing that says you're you're dead to sin... Is when, when you, when your mind actually um, conceives of who God is and what He's done for you and how He's going to save you and how you have eternal life and all that, um, getting into your brain to to realize what the real situation with the whole God thing is, and how you see how stupid and wasteful and selfish sin is, when you realize the goodness of God. Um, and how you, it, it just changes your thought waves. It changes how you think. It changes what you want. It changes your desires. It changes what you want out of life. Pretty much just changes your whole outlook, your whole perspective, your whole goals and all that stuff. And that's how and why you're dead to sin is because those things that used to interest you, you're not interested in them anymore. Yeah. When, when, the, when just sort of like the Holy Spirit, when it comes into your mind and it gives you your thoughts and it gives you your um, ideas and it gives you your, you're supposed to have the same desires that God desires and the same wants that God wants and the things that break his heart should break your heart. And it's kind of like, sort of like the opposite of demon possession where they just kind of come in and take over where the Holy Spirit does come in. It will 
take over where you let it. But, but when the Holy Spirit is in your mind, the things that repulse, it repulse you, the things that it desires, you desire. And so it's not so much, the, so it kind of is, so that's why it's dead is because there's someone else behind the wheel now and it changes who you used to be. Mom, do you want to read Romans 8, 9 for us? Well, you have to wait for me to look it up. Okay. <laughs> if someone else is ready, they can. All right. Still looking. Roman something. Eight. Roman eight? Yeah. Got eight what? Nine. Make up your mind. Is it eight or nine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Romans eight, verse nine. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. Aha! That's what I'm saying. That's why I had you forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. And if the spirit of God lives in you, oh, never mind. If the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Cool. That's what I was saying. My version says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. So again, we see that flesh again. Obviously, it's not talking about your physical body because, you know, I'm in it currently. Um, and I kind of like Paul's, like, he has, like, a little bit of a sass right here. And I love sass. For those who know me, I speak in sass a lot. Um, sass? Yeah. Like, S -S -S? Yeah, like, attitude. A little gotcha. sass. Um, Paul, I love how he says... You're not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> I love it because it's saying like, look, if God's spirit lives in you, which, you know, you're saying it does, then obviously you're dead to the flesh. So case closed the end. <laughs> like, like me and Paul would have gotten along really well in real life. <laughs> you foolish Galatians. <laughs> like, why are you so dumb? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. You did. Uh sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, the next one is Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Oh mom, by the way, Stephen is right there, and this is Shanice. Oh hey, how you doing? I saw Stephen. I didn't know her. Did you say Shanice? Yeah. He's gonna be at the four twenty-four. I will definitely. I love Ephesians. It, it, you said twenty to twenty-four. Twenty-two to twenty-four. Twenty-two to thirty-four. Okay. Uh, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. There you go. I mean, I can't, like, it can't get any more, like, clear, you know? Like, I don't know how, and I've told this to Skylar before, when he actually take a minute let's all appreciate Skylar for a minute he's the one that introduced all of this to me i'm sharing it with you so there you go <laughs> we appreciate you skylar <laughs> um so like i've heard the bible cover to cover like before i knew all of this like genesis to revelation right and somehow like i still missed it like it's everywhere in the New Testament, but that's why it's so important, like what you believe, like your misconceptions radically affect how you read scripture. Like just off the cuff, you know, that one verse about like, if you walk by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I used to read that verse as a condemnation. I used to read that verse and feel like, oh man, I just sinned today. So I must not be saved. You know, like, man, like, why am I still struggling with this? I must not be safe. You know what I mean? I used to read that as like a command. Like, you better not gratify the lust of the flesh if you walk in the spirit. You know, that's how I looked at it. But now when I see it, I view it as like, this is a promise. Like, it's not a command. He's not saying you better not. He's saying like, look, if you walk in the spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Like, it's not saying you better not. He's just saying you won't. Like, it's just. Because you don't want to. Huh? 
because you don't want to. Right. So like how you, what you believe in your mind radically affects how you read it. And so like in reading this one, like it's, it's, it couldn't get any clearer. It says, you know, in verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. Like right there, it says former, like not anymore to put off your old self. It doesn't say manage every day, you know, um, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, you know? And so again, it comes back to the fact like Romans 12 2, what does it say? We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are saved by grace through faith. All of this has to do with what we believe. Like what we believe to be true is going to be what we experience. Everything comes back to the attitude of our minds, renewing our minds, faith, all of that is like what we believe, you know, and it's, um, that's what we're going to experience. All right, the next one, back to Galatians, because Galatians is amazing. Galatians 5.24. Grace, is uh, Second Corinthians 10 on your list? Can you say that again? Thank you. Yeah, Second Corinthians uh, 10, 3 through 5 on your list. Yeah. Okay, cool. Add it to your list. Second Corinthians 10, 3 through 5? Yeah. Do you just want to read it right now since you mentioned it? Sure. Um, <laughs> I was, no, I was just looking through my my like Bible search of the word flesh and saw this and it's a famous verse. You guys have all heard this verse. Um, but it highlights the contrast between, um, uh, it, it highlights kind of how the, how the warfare plays out. Right. So though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion based against the knowledge of God. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Um, like I said, super popular, very familiar verse. But I think it's really important because it shows us, hey, we have physical bodies. We live in the flesh in that sense. But look... The war is not about trying to manage how your body behaves, like you just said. The war is in the spirit realm. Like Ephesians 6 says, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. And the place that this plays out is in our thoughts. Uh, yeah, like the very last verse says, sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So again, it's trying to change what we believe. You know, change what we know the truth. You know, the verse that says in John, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? If you're not free, then you must not know or believe the truth. <laughs> Bible study done. We can see now. <laughs> Yay! That was so amazing. Um, yeah. Hey, just a comment. Um, there's a lot of, like, feedback. So if like you're moving the phone, your phone around, it's making a lot of noise. So whoever you know, has that in mind, we can hear a lot of rustle, rustle. Um, yeah, if any if anybody has their phone and they're setting it down on the surface, the volume will will reverberate back into the phone, and that's what I think the feedback is coming from. Yeah, so just be aware of that. Um, okay, moving on back to Galatians, Galatians five twenty four. Who wants to knock that one out? You want to do it this time? Can you pull your one? Mom, I think it's you because you have your phone and you're moving a lot. Well, it was perfectly still while you guys were saying that, but he said if your phone is set down, that it, I moved it so that it wasn't, my, my hand wasn't behind it. You're hearing noises now. <laughs> but it's still now. <laughs> Anyways. She's going to read it for us, Galatians 5.24. All right. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Boom. The end. That's it, right there. 
Yeah, and obviously we're talking about the flesh being the sinful nature. Um, so if you belong to Christ, the flesh is dead, all of its passions and desires. So if you're experiencing passions and desires, where are they coming from? Not flesh. Where are they coming from? Bad boy. Meaning? Satan, 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 Satan. Flesh. Yeah, so if our flesh was killed, then if we're feeling temptation, desire to do something, it's um, coming from within us. It must be coming from external. We're not in a civil war. We're in an external war, right? Mm -hmm. All right. The last one for this one is John 12, 24 to 25. And I'll just go ahead and read this one. John 12, 24 to 25. Okay, so this is another example of like, how scripture suddenly makes sense. Like, it never made sense before when I was reading it. I was just like, what is he even talking about? Uh, I think Ryan pointed this out to me. So Ryan pointed this, this scripture out to me here. Um, John 12, 24 to 25 says, Jesus is talking. He says, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And when I read that the first time, I was like, before understanding this stuff, I was like, what is he talking about you dying and losing your life? And life? I was like, I have no idea what he, like, I have no idea what he's talking about. I was like, but now I totally get it. It's, it's, it's likening us, us to the wheat that falls to the ground. That seed has to die in order for it to become new, to sprout fruit, right? Our fruits of the spirit come from you know, the new creation. And then he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. And I think here, flesh, like anyone who loves their flesh or their sinful nature will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Saying like, you know, if you want to stay the way you are and you don't want to die in the flesh, then you know, you're going to end up losing your life in the end, you know, when, when, on judgment day. But if you hate your life in the flesh, you will keep it for eternal life because that means that your heart is like focused and like looking at the spirit, like the good things of God. Um, and I just think that's so cool because, like, now when I read this, I'm like, oh, this makes way more sense. <laughs> like, yeah. You have it through this this lens. Um, so, yeah. Does anybody have any other comments before we move on? I I just really, the emphasis on, uh, you know, the, the dying to sin. You know, what Jesus was talking about, he died. He died once and for all. Uh, in the same way, we ourselves should consider ourselves dead once and for all to sin and alive to God. Um, because that's where the fruits of the Spirit come from. They come from our new life given to us um, through Holy Spirit. And uh, just, just a little comment on what that looks like, this eternal life that's given to us. Jesus in actually the book of John 17.3, uh, he says eternal life is this, to know God and to know Jesus Christ in his sin. Um, if that's where eternal life comes from, and he's our root where we get our sustenance to produce these good works that we're called to, um, how else are we to receive that but the, an intimate relationship with God? Um, with, I, I mean, I, I come home, I close my door, I get on my knees, and I, I talk to him, and I give Holy Spirit leeway in every part of my life um, because I gave it up, and he's the one who's in me. Uh, and, yeah, anyways, I just think that's really important. It comes from a relationship. All of this. Amen. Hey, real quick, I'm gonna make a request. If you guys can put your mics on mute, if you're not speaking, that would get rid of a lot of the feedback. To say, turn your mic on, so that should make it a lot better. <laughs> um, I was literally just about to say that. Right here. <laughs> How do you do that? There should be a microphone symbol on your phone somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, um, at this point in time, I'm going to read a segment from my favorite book, which I will continue to recommend to everyone. <laughs> I should get paid for like free marketing. The book is called Mystical Union uh, by John Crowder. Look and be amazed. Please read this book. 
I will buy it for you and mail it to you if that's what it takes. Um, I'm gonna read just a few sections here. He has a good commentary on this whole concept of the flesh and all of that. Um, so yeah. All right. Understand that sin is not an action. The word sin is actually hamartia in the Greek, which means an inward element that produces evil acts. As the scriptures say, we know that our old self was put to death on the execution stake with him, so that the entire body of our sinful propensities might be destroyed. That's Romans 6.6. 6. You were united with him in a mystical death that took place. The thing that died was your old wicked heart. This is also called the old man or the fleshly nature. You died to sin. This means it is no longer a part of you. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You are a saint. Take the word sinner completely out of the equation now. Grace transformed you from one thing into another. Consider the following translations of the previous verse of Romans 6 2. How is it possible such persons as we are, who have been separated once for all from the sinful nature, any longer to live in its grip? God did not just pull you out of sin, he pulled sin out of you. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is much more than forgiveness of the old self. This entails the complete annihilation of the old self. God sank the whole ship. He did not just cover his eyes like Santa Claus, pretending he didn't see your naughty behavior, then put you on the nice list. That's not grace, that's stupidity. Grace did not just hide God's eyes from your naughty actions. It erased naughtiness itself out of your whole being. He didn't just give you a pretty screensaver, ignoring all the viruses, porn, and spyware on your hard drive. He wiped the whole hard drive out. The old sinner that you once were completely died to the same degree that Christ completely died. Death to self is not a lifelong process that is dependent on your own efforts. It was a final and complete act. The old you is not still hanging around just as you went under the water, so was this a picture of being buried in the ground with Christ? The old you was swallowed up into his death, and the thing that was spit back out of the water was the new creation in Christ. Um, and there's one more section I want to read. But did anybody have any thoughts on that before I read the next one? I know you're all muted, but you can unmute yourself. <laughs> that was excellent. Yeah, it's a really good book. You all really need to buy it or read it, or I will buy it and make you read it either way. <laughs> all right, the next part. <laughs> Steve, I've, I'll already, make you do it. I've already done it to Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> she makes me do all kinds of stuff. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay, the next part I want to read is here. It's called The Battle is Over. <clears throat> the truth is that you do not have to kill off or fight those negative emotions or sinful appetites. The truth is that the old appetites have already died. Stop trying to shadow box something that doesn't exist. Agree with the truth that you are a new creation. You don't make yourself new. Stop striving. Rest in the reality that the old you is dead and powerless. It was nailed to the tree. The new you is enthralled with the pleasures of God. The truth leaves no other option but joy. Whether you feel it or not, you are now one body and one spirit with Christ rest in that reality and you will feel his presence faith comes before the feeling and faith is simply trust believe that this mystical, mystical mystical death really took place and you will cease to act like that old man very simply the gospel is a revelation that you have died with him basically having faith in what jesus said so <clears throat> one of the repercussions of this gospel message is that it leaves no more room for active sin in the life of a believer by making theological room for a sinful nature that no longer exists, religion conveniently gives you a myriad of excuses for bad behavior. It's okay, we're all still sinners. No, you're not. Well, nobody's perfect. The Bible says you are. <laughs> we'll all struggle on this side of heaven. You're already seated in heavenly places. And I'm only human, not if you're a Christian. <laughs> of course, we all sin every day. What Bible verse is that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, some would criticize us for preaching what they assume to be the perfection theology. They would say the gospel is not this simple. 
but that's why they killed Jesus because it was that simple. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah. Any thoughts about that? I do. Okay, mom. What if someone that supposedly really feels as though they're a Christian and they're really into the whole shebang and yet let's say they have an addiction it could be alcohol some what if they have a sex addiction and they still continue to watch porn or they still commit adultery does that mean that they are not truly a christian they're not going to go to heaven because they still have that sin in their life so it's just kind of like real black and white so if someone is still sexually addicted and is still active in it but they profess that they're a Christian, are they not? Great question. This is what we've, I've been talking about with Skylar and another person in a group chat all day for the past couple of days. Um, Skylar, do you want to say anything first? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so ultimately, uh, Stacy, to your, to your question, in the final analysis, you know, Somewhere there is a line, and God is the one that makes that final decision. Um, but we can have a pretty good idea of what he's looking for when he makes that call. Um, specifically to the kind of situation that you're talking about, there are some passages that address that. Um, one of the ones is uh, 1 John chapter 3, um, verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. Now, I understand, I've known people with addictions. Um, Skylar from the past, right, had issues like this, and so I get it, and I understand that there's a physiological thing that happens. Um, but the bottom line is if we actually believe the gospel and see the freedom that's available to us, we're not going to settle for anything less. Like we will press into it as far as it goes to find freedom. And that might, that might also include things like counseling, you know, and treatment or whatever. Um, but the point is that you can't say, I'm following Jesus and then live a life that overtly displays a lack of following Jesus. Like that's not a thing, you know, and that's why Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do all this stuff? And he even cites miraculous things, right? And he said, and his response is, I, I didn't know you. We didn't have this, con this intimate connection, this vibrant new life, you, know, you and me and me and you kind of thing. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but um, so the point is, can Christians still sin? Yes, we can still choose to sin. Um, but at a certain point, if we're just willfully, yeah, I know that's wrong, but I'm just going to keep doing it, and there's no real our hearts pressing into to pursuing freedom and getting it into our, our minds and our hearts and, and just breaking out of the prison, right, that Jesus has, has opened for us, at a certain point, we kind of have to ask, do we actually believe the gospel? So I want to take a stab at this because, um, I mean, my whole life, I, I, before I think mom got on here, um, like, I was super sincere in my Christian walk. Like, I never, like, was just like, oh, I don't care. I'm just going to do whatever. I always wanted to do the right thing, but I was, I found that I was unable to. I was stuck in, like, these patterns of, like, of, you know, toxic behaviors and self-sabotaging things because I didn't know, I didn't believe that a new creation and freedom was possible. So, what in this scenario that you brought up mom someone who calls themselves a christian and still does all this sin i find that there's one of two reasons for that one either it's a heart issue or number two it's a knowledge issue so in the first case someone who has a heart issue it's like 
they, they, they fall into the cheap grace mentality. They're like, oh, well, you know, they don't really plan on stopping this. They really have no desire to stop their behavior, but they're just using grace as like a license to just do whatever they want. And they're like, well, you know, there's God's grace is sufficient for me and God loves me. He understands we're all sinners, you know, that kind of thing. They don't actually intend to stop, right? So that's a heart issue. On the other hand, there's the knowledge issue, which is the camp that I found myself in because I did not want to keep doing the things that I was doing. Like I hated it. Like I wanted to stop. Right. But I didn't know that it was possible to not because I identified with the with the theology that my sinful nature is alive and well and that it's going to be alive and well forever. And that I have to constantly wrestle against myself and that, like, my Christian walk is just going to be a series of striving and struggling and like whack a mole my sinful nature over and over and over again. And so it's kind of like and we'll get to this in a second. Um, it's like a prisoner who's in a jail cell right? They're going to think they're stuck in that jail cell as long as they believe that the door is, is locked, you know, but, and, but when you realize, oh, hey, the door is unlocked, you can walk out any time, you're suddenly experience freedom. If you believe the door is locked, even if it's unlocked, you're never going to experience freedom, right? And so I'm going to read, when you were talking, mom, I looked up, um, there's a quick commentary that the book talks about this, actually, and I just want to read it because I think it's really good. Um, it says, some people see a disparity between what they believe and what their daily lives look like. This very gap between the scriptures and the reality of their daily lives is what causes so many theologians and Christian therapists to contort the word of God and conform it to their naughty behavior. In other words, they think, because I still sin, then surely I still have a sinful nature. But you never base the truth on your experiences. Instead, your experiences should be dictated by the truth. If you still wrestle with sin as a believer, there are a couple of options as to why this may be. The question has a multiple choice answer. Question, if I don't have a sinful nature, why do I still sin? Option A, maybe you're an unbeliever. And option B, maybe no one ever told you any of this. And I know that sounds really harsh, but like when I read that, like my mind was like, whoa. <laughs> because literally he hit the nail on the head. He said, either you're an unbeliever, it's a heart issue, or maybe no one ever told you any of this, and it's a knowledge issue. So, like, for me, it was definitely one of the knowledge issues. When I finally learned, I experienced the freedom that I was never able to have before. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, or do you still have questions? I can't hear you, Mom. You have to unmute your mic. I thought I did, but it went back. Um... I guess I'm going to say something a little politically incorrect. It's just that I find that there are people who profess to be Christian, but I can tell by their behaviors. I, I think it's, I think it's phony. I think it's just. That's fair. It, pardon? That's fair. Yeah. I, because, um, I mean, if someone is plans to say, uh, commit adultery all the time under the guise of you know the the facade that they put on I think because it says I don't know what the exact scripture is but there's a long list of people he says like whoremongers and liars and thieves and murderers and all this blah 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 they will not be in heaven and that's because that's where their heart is they're still into that kind of stuff that kind of stuff really turns them on and they really like it and so um and like you know so, but I, you know, I, I, I meet people and, um, they, they, they're always like gossiping about other people and they are, they were, and they're falsely accusing of things and, um, just like they have little vicious hearts. And I'm thinking that doesn't sound like how you should be thinking and treating people. And I mean, so there's, I mean, gossip is one thing, deliberate, you know, adultery is another thing. And there's all these little you know, different variations and, in, uh, intensities of, of what I would say not Christ-like behavior. And I'm thinking, I don't think they really have that new insight on, on life. I don't, I think it's all fake. It's all phony. I don't think they're truly Christ followers at all. I think it's just a facade. I mean, yeah, and that's fair. I mean, there's always going to be people that are culturally Christian. You know, they grew up that way and that's just what they identify as. They're like, oh, well, I believe in God. So that makes me a Christian. I'm like, no, the devil believes in God and he's definitely not a Christian, but you know, so fortunately, you know, I'm not God. You're not God. God's the one that can judge the heart. So 
you know, obviously that is, that is true that there are a lot of people that claim to be Christians that aren't. Um, so yeah. Um, um, which I'm glad we're talking about this because it kind of segues nicely into the next thing we're going to talk about, um, which is, okay, now that we understand that the fleshly sinful nature is dead, what does that mean? So now we're left with some choices and some consequences of that, right? Now we can't, you know, knowing that the simple nature is dead, we don't have the excuse of, oh, well, you know, I can just live however I want now and grace is sufficient. Like that option is now eliminated to us. So now we have some choices and we've got some consequences. Um, but first I want to, there's three analogies. I already said one of them about the prisoner, but there's two other analogies that I want to bring up to kind of like, uh, put into perspective, like what this all looks like. Um, cause we were talking today with another person about like, okay, is it, you know, if you're a born again, Christian, is it possible to, you know, still live in sin? And, you know, if once saved, always saved that kind of question. And so one of the analogies I like to use is like, let's say you're an orphan and you live in like the slums, you know, and you live in a, in the squalor, you know, like out in the street or whatever. And the king of the, the land, um, you know, sees you one day and he's like, hey, I want to adopt you. Okay, so he goes through all the paperwork, um, you know, gets all the legal signatures and all that stuff. Um, and now it's official, like he's adopted you, like you are now officially their son or they're officially their daughter. They bring you into the palace. Um, you know, now you have two choices. Like your identity is no longer an orphan. Like that, you may feel like one still, but that's not who you are. You are now officially legally that person's son or daughter, right? So now no longer are you an orphan, you are a prince or a princess because your dad's the king, right? So now you have a choice. You can choose, you know, like, hey, you know, I don't really feel like I'm a princess. I still feel like an orphan. And you can like leave the palace anytime and like go back and live on the streets. But does that change the fact that you still have the legal documentation and the certificate of adoption saying that you are the king's daughter or you are the king's son? No, like you still are that, but you're just acting like you're not, right? You have that choice. You also have the choice of being like, you know what, regardless of how I feel, you know, I might still feel like an orphan, but I'm going to believe that this, you know, the king says I'm their child, I'm their son or daughter. I believe that I'm a prince or princess, and that's how you choose to live. Um, so this, you know, comes back to the element of choice. Like, just because you're a new creation doesn't mean that choice is somehow taken from you. You still always have the choice of what you're going to do. Um, but people think, you know, like, well, if I choose to sin, that means I'm, I'm, I must not be a new creation. I'm like, no, you still are. Like, if you, if you accepted Jesus and that's what you, and that's what you chose, but you're just not believing it and you're not living like it. Does that make sense? Another analogy is like in marriage. Um, like if two people get married, um, obviously, you know, they've made a commitment to each other. The husband has committed to be with you and the wife is committed to be with him. Um, you know, just because you're married doesn't mean you don't have choices. Like at any point, one of the parties can choose, you know, to go cheat, right? Does that mean like, if you're in someone else's bed that you are no longer someone's wife? It's like, no, you still are that, but you're just acting like you aren't. Right. And so like this concept gets confusing to people because they think, oh, well, you know, if I'm a new creation, but I've sinned, then I must not really be a new creation. I'm like, no, there's a difference between like your behavior and your identity. One. And number two, there's a difference between willful, continual sin and versus like a stumble. There's a difference if I'm married to someone and, you know, he's committed to me full wholeheartedly and fully. And, you know, he has a out of character moment where he accidentally, you know, gets drunk and accidentally sleeps with somebody and totally regrets it and comes to me and is honest about it. And is like, look, I'm so sorry this happened. And, you know, makes amends and like never even talks to her ever, ever again, like blocks her number, like, you know, all of that. That's different than like someone who's like, oh yeah, they try to hide it from you and they continually do it behind your back over and over again. There's never any like change of heart you know, they don't have any intention of stopping. They plan to do it. They make plans to continue doing that. And, you know, this comes back to the once saved, always saved. Like, is that person still my husband? Yes. But at some point I can choose to end that relationship. Right. And that comes back to the mercy of God. Like what Skylar was saying, there's somewhere, there's a point where, you know, God decides like, I'm going to give them up to their wicked ways. Right. We can't pretend to know where that line is. 
Um, fortunately, we know that God is merciful and like he knows our hearts and everyone else's hearts better than we can. Um, so it's like, why test it? Like why push him? Like he's not going to divorce us as long as it's possible or as long as he feels like, you know, there's a chance. But as soon as it becomes apparent that like we have no interest in being committed, he's going to let us go. Right. It's not once married, always married. There's always a potential for divorce, but like, you know, the option, like we can feel comfortable and like secure in, in the knowledge that like God is not going to divorce us for a stumble. Like I would not divorce my husband for a mistake like that because obviously that's not his heart. You know, does that make sense? Skylar looking, you, you look like you want to say something. Oh, no, I think, you, I think you crushed it, Grace. Crushed. Crushed. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge distinction between willful continual sin and like a stumble, right? You know, obviously stumbling is not the same um, in terms of where your heart's at. Um, anyway, so those are my analogies. Um, there's like a few Bible verses I want to look at just to kind of look at like, yes, there are some serious choices and consequences that we have to take seriously. It's not just, oh, also I'm a new creation. Everything's fine. And then you're like, no, it doesn't matter what I do because there's grace. Like, no, like it still matters. Um, so again, we're going to go back to Romans because Romans pretty much is just where it's at and answers everything. Uh, Romans eight, five through eight. Anybody want to read it? Anybody? I got you. All right. Steven's going to read it from the NLT. Yeah. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Ryan, go ahead. Uh, um, Saw it in your face. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, the, the, like Skylar mentioned, the mind is, is everything. You know, the mind is where that, that warfare takes place. And, and, and simply setting the mind on what we've been given uh, alone produces in our lives this what life and peace uh, but with everything that we've talked about so far, the one thing that's been just on my heart, coming to my mind, is what is the gospel? The gospel is a relationship between a father and a son and a daughter. That's the whole reason Jesus died, not because we were sinners, but because we were lost sons. He died for our sins to redeem us to the life that he wanted us to have. The veil was torn. And we enter into a relationship with God. You know, we talked about you know, Christians who sin, Christians who, who, who don't sin, and, and, I, and I, I get it, and everything you're said, saying is 100% making sense. Um, I just like, for this is for me, I just go, like, I lived my whole life selfish. I lived my whole life for myself, stuck in my sin, and in one moment in time, God went, I love you. I'm for you. I'm not against you. You're amazing. I looked in the mirror. I hated everything I saw my whole life. I hated myself. And God went, I think you're so amazing. God, why do you think I'm so amazing? How do you, why do you love me so much? Where's the proof that you love me? He's a man. He's hanging on the cross. He's madly in love with you. So much so he was willing to give up your life. So why do I not sin? I don't sin because God's my dad and I love him. This grace, this power, we, we sometimes we, we talk about these things, and yet we don't realize what it is. The grace comes from the love of God, and the love of God is what transforms us through love, by love, for love. And all of a sudden, you know, we talk about giving up our life. All of a sudden, I give up my life, not because it's, it's a burden or, or, or anything like that, not because I want it. It's not like a begrudging thing is what I mean. I don't give up my life like, and, you know, still holding on to it. No, I don't want it. I want you. I want all of you. This is the gospel. This is the whole reason Jesus died. That's what brings freedom. That's the truth that sets you free. It's the love of God. 
And and why wouldn't I set my mind on any, why would I set my mind on anything else? Why would I set my mind on anything that's not the God who set me free from me? Ah, it's just it's the gospel. Thank it's you. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Um yeah, I mean, but Romans 8, 9, or sorry, 5 through 8, it shows that we have a choice in the matter. Like, we can choose where we set our mind on. We can choose to set our mind on the flesh, like the sinful nature, blah, 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 sinful things. Or we can choose to have it set on the spirit, right? So that's a choice. And then it tells you the consequence of that. You know, if your mind is governed by the flesh, it's death. If the, you're governed by the spirit, it's life and peace. Um, yeah, so I mean, clearly there's, there's a choice involved, you know, just because you get married one time doesn't mean that you never have to make choices again. Like, oh, well, I chose you once. No, you have to continually choose that person every day. Like at any point you can unchoose them and go off and sleep with somebody else, right? There's a continual choosing. Um, and the next one is Galatians 5, 13, 16. Um, I'll just read it. It's Galatians 5, 13 and 16, not all the way through. So verse 13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another in love. So again, we see here people, this, he's addressing people of the cheap grace mentality, the people with the heart issue, like my mom was talking about. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, so there's freedom in the gospel. We're set free from sin, like that, that realization, like, oh my gosh, I am free. I can walk out of this prison cell any minute now because the door's unlocked. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, meaning don't say, oh, well, I'm free. I can do whatever I want because great, grace is sufficient, right? Don't fall into that cheap grace mentality. Um, and then verse 16, this is the one that I was talking about. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And like, this used to be one of my most hated verses because I didn't understand it. And now it is one of my most favorite verses ever. Like I used to hate this verse because it, when I read it, I felt condemned. I was like, well, man, I've gratified the, the desires of my flesh today. So, oh my gosh, am I walking in the spirit? Do I even have the spirit? Am I even saved? Like, you know, that whole, I'm, I'm sure all of you have questioned your salvation at some point, you know, like before learning all this stuff, but now it's like, God is saying like, Hey, you have a choice here. If you walk by the spirit, you know, and you, you believe in the new creation and you just, then you just won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Like it's a promise. It's not a command. Right. And I just love that. Um, can I call upon someone to read Hebrews 10, 26 through 29? Kayla, you're super quiet. Can you at least read a scripture? Miss, Miss Wonder, what is it? Wisdom? Princess Purity. <laughs> uh, that's mine, but I'm reading from uh, King James. Is that okay? I'm sorry. We don't accept that here. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> it's, wait, do you, do you really not accept it? Was that your sarcasm? That, that was the one time I didn't pick up. Yes, that was sarcasm. <laughs> um is it, it's hebrews 10 26 to 29 26 to 29 i just love to hear your voice and your accent so i want others to be you know blessed with that as well oh you're so sweet <laughs> um sorry i'm just getting it quickly hebrews 10 26 to 29 um, for if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth that there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Um, he that despised Moses's law died without mercy and the two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the son of God and hath counted the blood, uh, sorry about that, of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. 
Wow, King James really is, like, fancy. <laughs> fancy. Um, so that first line is really strong. Like, he does not beat around the bush at all. He says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. And that's a really powerful, strong statement, isn't it? Like, he's basically saying, like, look, after you've realized the truth of the gospel, that you've been set free from sin, and that you're a new creation, but yet you just, you deliberately continue on deliberately sinning, this is the difference between a stumble and a deliberately, continually, as a pattern of your behavior. There's no sacrifice for sins left. Because, like, what else, what else is there? Like, you know the truth, but your heart's like, no, I don't want any part of that. Like, you know? And then it says, um... Um, you know, they talk about, they compare Moses. They said, you know, anyone who rejected the law died, you know, and was put to death, but they're saying, so how much more those who've rejected Jesus will be treated, you know, how they will be treated. And so they're saying like, look, you couldn't even keep the law, <laughs> but like, if you can't even keep like Jesus doing it all for you, like what, what else can they give you? Like, there's no sacrifice left. Does anybody have any thoughts on this? I know it's a pretty strong and powerful, um, verse. I think me and Skylar were discussing this earlier today. Did you bring this up or was it Dale that brought it up? It wasn't me, um, but something about this verse that that uh, I noticed, which I don't know if you mentioned this in your sanctification Bible study or not, but um, verse 29 is pretty interesting. It says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? And has outraged the spirit of grace. What about it? That's pretty intense. I mean, because it's, he's saying, like, look, you, you were sanctified. You were made holy. You know? So there's this, there's this. See, throughout the scripture, God tells us, this is who you are. And then he says, be who you are. Like, there's the, I've done this, I've established this in you, you've been made righteous, now live from that place, right? I mean, he's saying you've been sanctified, you are holy, and then there's the command, be holy, as he is holy. But the problem is that we, we put the cart before the horse and we're like, oh, I'm not holy, so I need to become holy. It's like, no, no, you already are holy. Now, continue, <laughs> live from that place. Yeah. Were you going to say something to me? No, I was just, I'm back on my point. The fact that you already have the truth, you should have to adhere to it. Like, really, yeah. Could you guys hear her? <laughs> yeah, they're all shaking their heads. Sorry, I'm just, I'm <laughs> she sorry. was saying that um, the fact that they had the truth and they still chose to not have it, she's like, that's just really sad. Like, what else is left for you? Like, and the truth made you sanctified, the thing you're trying to do yourself. So it's like, it got you what you were trying to get, but yet you're like, nah, I'm still going to do what I want. Like, what else is there? You know, and this comes back to like, you've got a choice and there's consequences. You know, it's not people, when I try to explain this, like this new way to look at, you know, salvation in the gospel, they think like, oh, well, this, this doctrine is, is dangerous because it gives people a license to do whatever they want. I'm like, no, like that's, if that's where your heart is, then sure. But like, you know, a person whose heart is really for it, they're not going to hear that, you know, and I can't control the state of somebody's heart. I can only control like the knowledge that I give to them. Um, anyways, moving on. We've got three verses left. Okay. We're almost done. Um, second Peter two, 20 to 21. Second Peter 2, 20 to 21. Mom, do you want to read it? You're on mute. Um, I was still writing it down. Uh, I haven't looked it up yet. Second Peter 2, 20 to 21. Okay. Give me a second. I'm going to set the phone down. I can do it faster. 
And just in case anyone wants to see the verses, I'm gonna hold them up right there. Can you see that? Taking too long to find it. Okay, does anybody else have it? 2021? Yes, I can. 2021. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up again and then stay by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command that they were given to live a holy life. <laughs> Shanice oh. goes, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Paul does not, or Peter, wait, no. Did Peter yeah, write Peter? Peter. Is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Peter does not beat around the bush here. Um, I mean, neither did Paul. He says, um, blah, 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 blah. If they've escaped the corruption of the world, knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then become entangled in it and overcome again, they are worse off than they were at the beginning. Like, ah, it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on it. <laughs> like, you know, we can't deny that, like, you know, this isn't just a mamsy pansy, God is a doormat, oh, I love you and it's all great gospel, right? Like, it, that's not what it is. People hear that, Skylar, stop laughing at me. <laughs> like, people... We'll look at that and be like, oh, well, God's a pushover, it's a doormat, it's easy. I'm like, no, no. Like, you know, there comes a point where, like, a wife who's been cheated on enough and is clear that her husband is not, like, in this marriage, she will walk away. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, we don't know where that point is with God, so why are we pushing it? Right? Like, anyways. And after, like, God showed us how goodness, why would you want to push it? That's my question. Mm -hmm. like, right. I don't even want to. And that comes back to your heart. Like, Come in. Huh? I'm just like totally agreeing with what Stephen yeah, so said. Why can you turn away from somebody that's been that good to you? Because it's the heart issue, right? Like yeah. there's either one of two reasons. It's a knowledge deficit, which is what I had, or a heart issue. Like, unfortunately, I can't fix someone's heart issue. Right? I can present to them the truth. It's their, it's their choice what they want to do with it, you know? Um, all right. The next one is John 15, 1 through 6. John 15, 1 through 6. Can someone read it that has been quiet for a while? What was it? John 15, 1 through 6. You want me to read it, Grace? Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Okay. John 15, 1 through 6. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband's husbandsman. Let's see. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. Hold on, I can't see. Hold on. Um, the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me you can do nothing if a man abideth in me he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned oh uh, if a man if a man abide not in me he is cast forth as a branch and is withered with the with that the King James Version, mm -hmm. and is withered, and men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay. Yeah, so this time, this is out of, like, Jesus' own mouth, not Paul or Peter, so we can't just, like, brush that away. Like, Jesus himself 
said these things, right? Um, something I want to point out in this is 15 verse 3. Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Like, <laughs> why are we still trying to accomplish something that the cross already accomplished? You know, um, like, ah, and then he says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. Essentially saying, stop trying through works. Like literally he's like, stop, <laughs> you're already clean. Right. Um, you know, and then he comes to the point where he's like, hey, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. But, so we have a choice there. We can choose to remain in him or choose to not remain in him. This comes back to the marriage analogy. You can, you can choose to stay in that marriage and be committed in that marriage, or you can choose to walk away. Same thing with the orphan analogy. You can choose to stay with the king, or you can be like, you know what? I just really want to go back to the streets for whatever reason and somehow earn the right to become a princess one day. Like, no, it's like, he's given you that right. Like, why are you trying to earn it when he gave it to you, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are, that, that's out of the mouth of Jesus himself. Anybody have a thought about that? Ryan, it looks like you were going to say something. You're muted. Okay. Um, any thoughts on this before I move on? One thing I want to point out um, that goes back to a previous study I had done on union and intimacy um, that was, I think, two weeks ago, um, is that he's talking about the vine and the branch, like we are the branch connected to the vine, right? And he's talking about bearing fruit and remaining in him and we will bear fruit. One of the things that I think we we get confused is like, okay, well, the fact that we're growing, you know, and getting better and maturing shows that we're like getting better at managing our behavior. Therefore, sanctification must be a process because we're getting better than we were. And it's like, no, you're not growing to achieve something. You're growing because you already have achieved it, right? Like you can't bear fruit if you don't have connection with the vine. So you're growing out of a connection you already have. You're not growing in order to become connected, right? It's impossible to bear fruit apart from a connection. Does that make sense? So the fact that you are growing shows that you've already been sanctified, now that you're trying to achieve it. Does that make sense? I, don't, I see blank faces. I don't know what that means. Well, uh, you have a good um, analogy there with the vine. You know what a gardening maniac I am. You know, if a uh, as a plant starts to grow and and in, in this case it would be the really long thick part of a, a vine but then yeah it has these little spindly branches that come off of it and because it is connected to the vine those branches get longer and longer and longer they have more leaves they have more blossoms they end up doing more fruit because they're connected to the vine as soon as you cut that limb off then it withers and dies and so People continue to grow because they're connected to God the same way a branch continues to grow because it's connected to the vine. And it's not, the, the, the branch does not grow so that it can be connected to the vine. It grows because it is connected to the vine. And right. we grow in our, in our character and our behaviors and our self-discipline and all that because we're connected to God and he just makes us branch out and continue to blossom and because he is guiding us and giving us well because we're connected to him like like the branch is to the vine he feeds us and nourishes us and gives us the strength and the wisdom and we just have one more accomplishment after another after another through time spent with him and him changing our minds and our thoughts and all that yeah um, I wasn't planning on reading this, but because I read it already before in a previous study, but it's just a, a little thing um, that I thought of that perfectly talks about what we're talking about. It says from the book again, <laughs> can one truly get closer to God? Has Christ only brought us part way? Consider the analogy of a vine and a branch. It is impossible for a branch to grow any closer to the vine than it already is. The two are physically connected. 
there is no breach that is progressively being filled. Now, does the branch continue to grow? Yes, it even flourishes, buds, and bears fruit. But is it growing towards union or because of union? Boom, mic drop, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and one more little thing. Um, we acknowledge that a father's faith may be more mature than a child's, but simple childlike trust is the gold standard in the kingdom. One has no less access to God than the other. Each is perfect for his age. For this reason, it is foolish for us to compare ourselves one with another. A sapling, or a baby tree, is the same substance as a mighty oak. One may be more mature than the other, but both are fully and completely still trees. We are all now the same substance and body of Christ. We are all the same substance of holiness, whether sapling or fully grown. So I really like that um, because it kind of just destroys the argument that like, oh, well, I see myself growing. So therefore, sanctification must be a process. Therefore, you know, I die daily and my sinful nature is slowly being killed off little by little. And that must mean that it's really dependent upon my works rather than accepting the new creation of Christ that he's really offered me. You see how like all these mentalities like uh, are in, or what's the word? Um, Work together. Uh, yes. Uh, entangled, intertwined. Thank you. Um, Skylar was about to say that. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's really important to look at, like, the foundational things behind what we believe and see, it, like, oh, is it actually in scripture, or is that just something I grew up hearing? Um, anyways, and the last verse I have for the day, or night, or whatever it is, is Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right, I have it. Shanice is going to read it. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. For their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is far, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. All right, so I feel like we're noticing a theme here. Like all these verses are kind of saying the same thing, but in a different way. Um, it's showing like, hey, you have a choice and there's a consequence for that choice, right? They're talking about bearing fruit. Um, at the very end of this, it says land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. Um, you know, what's that phrase? Uh, I don't know if this is actually, where, if this is a verse um, where it says you'll know them by their fruits. Is that actually a verse or is that just something people say? Do you, what verse is it, Skylar? Hold on, let me find it. He's a, the Bible encyclopedia. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, Mom, you were asking, like, okay, you know, this Christian, they're doing all this stuff, right? You know, and they're calling themselves a Christian, but yet they're doing X, Y, and Z. It's like, you know, God, they're saying, like, you will know, you'll know a tree by its fruits, Right? An apple tree does not have to strive and try really, really hard to produce apples, right? Like that sounds silly and ridiculous. If it's connected to the source and if it's rooted in the soil and the sun, it's going to naturally produce apples. It doesn't have to go produce apples now. Like it's not striving by works to produce fruit, right? In the same way, if we're connected to the vine, if we're in Jesus, if we are the new creation, we will naturally produce fruit. Right. And he's saying, like, if you're not, you know, there's a reason for that. And there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians, whether they be cultural Christians or they really just are just, you know, in the cheap grace camp, which is really no different than a non-believer just using grace as a band-aid to justify their behavior. Um, you'll know them by their fruits. Um, and Scholar, did you find it? Yeah, uh, it's in Matthew 7. Um, he's talking about false prophets, but he uses that general topic 
to make a comparison between good trees and bad trees. Um, so this is Matthew 7, uh, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And I would like to say as well, look at the very next verse that comes. The very next passage, as he continues speaking, is that section where he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, he goes on, right, and says, Depart from me, I never knew you. Pretty striking. Yeah, so essentially what I'm trying to show here is that, I mean, pretty much all of the verses we looked at kind of say the same thing in a different way. Um, but it's removing the choice from us where we can look at grace as a license to do whatever. He's taking, like, like there is no room for that in scripture. There is no place where you can be like, yes, I'm a Christian and I'm saved, but yet, you know what? Next time I get into a relationship, I plan on sleeping with them. Or like, you know, that's their plan. Like, it's not like they were trying to not and they stumble, they repent and keep moving off in purity. But like, that was their goal, their plan, their whole reason for getting into a relationship. Two totally different things, right? So looking at these, these choices and consequences, it eliminates the possibility of us using grace as an enabler and can only view grace as an empower. Was that chapter seven? Matthew chapter seven, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's all I have. Um, is there anybody that has any comments, questions, concerns? <laughs> Just one thing that's been ringing in my mind. Uh, back where Jesus was talking about the branch and the vine, uh, right after that in verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, period. And then he says, Abide in my love, period. That's it. Like, I know I say this all the time, but that's the whole gospel. Jesus opened up the way for us to abide in the love of God, his full intent. In the first place, it says the mystery hidden in Christ has been revealed. The mystery of God's will that was first prophesied about in the Old Testament has been revealed. His whole purpose, our whole purpose for being alive has been revealed in Christ Jesus. Abide in my love. I love you. I'm for you. I'm not against you. That alone, faith in that creates an avenue for God's grace to come into our lives through this love. To, to empower us to walk out what the truth calls us to. Why? Because our desires are changed. Exactly uh, what, you have, what you said, Stacey. Exactly. That's the truth. The desires are changed, but all of it comes from one word. It's really, really simple. It's called love. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> awesome. All right. That is my entire commentary. So unless anyone else has anything to say i'm gonna stop recording speak now forever hold your peace